Let me tell you about Jesus. It is how He done for me. How He saved a poor lost sinner, and by His blood I've been set free. What a miracle we were given some two thousand years ago. God the Father sent Him to us all because He loved us so. Let me tell you about Jesus and just what He's done for me. How He saved a poor lost sinner by His Thank God for my wife, and she's been a faithful help me to me. Uh, we were missionaries in Mexico, actually, for eight years, from 1982 to 1990. And on our way here tonight, we passed the Monroe County Jail, which I pointed out to my future son-in-law. And I was able to work there four years as a full-time chaplain with Good News Young Prison Ministry. And that was a blessing, as well as Mrs. King uh, was a volunteer as well. And um, God is so good. And... After that, God called me back to the mission field. And one of the verses he used uh, for that, there were several steps that he used. I'd just like to share Isaiah chapter 42 for a second because um, this is a text that God used to call me there. My wife and I, um, well, to back up just a little bit, I was working in the jail there. And for about a month or so, I just felt real heavy, not because of a sin problem I had or any other problem in my life. But I just knew that God was moving me uh, somewhere else. And I, I just uh, felt so heavy that I could hardly even minister. And people looked at me and said, what's the matter with you? And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I was praying about it. I didn't know. And then I went to a missions conference. Um, uh, what was uh, Pastor White's church called? Lighthouse Baptist Church, no? I went there, and uh, Bobby Bonner was preaching a missionary from Africa. And God really used that preaching, and he said, is God calling anybody in the mission field? And the Holy Spirit said, I'm calling you back. And uh, God just spoke to my heart. I told my wife about it. And so we started looking over towards Africa, and of course, we had learned some Spanish. And we, we wanted to know if there was any uh, countries that spoke Spanish in the Africa area. And there was one in the middle of Africa, somewhat there. Um, I can't remember the something, Guinea, Guinea, if I remember right. And then we saw the Canary Islands, and of course, uh, we know a little bit of Spanish, so we started praying about the Canary Islands also. And uh, I got some counsel, and I had a preacher pray for me, a very godly preacher. And the next day, I opened up in my devotions to Isaiah chapter 42, and I won't read all of it, but um, there's like three or four times in here where God mentions the isles. And of course, the Canary Islands are seven islands off the coast of Morocco, Africa. They're part of Spain. They were colonized by Spain. And... Um, in verse 6, for example, God said, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison. Also, one of the main ministries we have over there is a prison ministry, and I'll comment on that in a second here. And it says, them that sit in the darkness out of the prison house, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Um... And then in verse 10, he says, Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. So there, God talks about the isles. And then in verse 12, he says, Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. And also there, and then I think there's one or two other places in that chapter that God spoke to me. And if you ever had God speak to you out of the Bible, which I'm sure you have if you're a believer, if you haven't, well, uh, maybe you need to check to see if you're saved. But um, 
But I'm telling you what, I'll just be honest with you. God spoke to me, and in no uncertain terms, I knew that God was speaking to me through this. And I mean, if God would have spoken in an audible voice out of the corner of the house and said, Doug, I'm calling you to the Canary Islands, it wouldn't have been any more clear than this passage. I mean, God just said, that's where I want you to go. And so that's how I know that God wants us to go there. Then we narrowed in on Tenerife, which is one of the bigger of the seven islands, if not the biggest, um, has about a million people. And uh, so we've been there 15 years, and uh, some of our children have grown up there. And I do thank God for my, my family. Uh, Nathan was our firstborn, of course. And um, as you know, he's, he served with his wife and family 10 years in Mozambique, and what a blessing that is, and now he's here. And he also was a volunteer in the jail, right? And uh, then another daughter was a missionary in Belize for about 10 years. And then Rebecca uh, is married as my second uh, youngest daughter. And she got married, and they want to, they're going to be missionaries to the Middle East somewhere and minister to the Muslim people, the Arabic people. And then another daughter, Jenny, married a, a man from Fairhaven Baptist Church, and they have a, they have a Baptist Church in Pennsylvania. Um, and my other daughter, Hannah, is serving the Lord. And, of course, Leanne is here and should be getting married about October 1st, right, Joel? <laughs> so I thank God for putting Joel with Leanna, a uh, real man of God. I love him dearly, and he's just a blessing. So anyway, I'll just tell you a little bit about our ministry. Um, we went over there, and I thought I spoke pretty good Spanish, but their accent's a little bit different. You know, if you think about America, the people from Louisiana speak different than the people than the Midwest, right? And if you're from New York City, then that's, they speak a little bit different, too, especially the tax drivers, no? Taxi drivers. <laughs> and people from Boston and people from Maine, right? Well, it's the same way in Spain. So you have the, the Spain is the original language, but then you have all the people in Latin America, South America, um, Cuba as well, right? And other countries, Venezuela. But their accent's a little bit particular, and I had a lot of trouble with it. I really did. I got discouraged because they tend to run words together. They drop S's off of words, and I'm sure other countries do, too. But uh, I got a little bit discouraged about it, you know. I, I'm thinking I can understand about 40 or 50 percent of what these people are saying. I didn't feel quite so bad. I talked to this one lady from the Canary Islands. And she said, when I go visit my parents in Spain, in a peninsula, which is about two and a half hour plane ride, she says, my parents can't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> she said, seriously. She said, don't feel too bad because the accents are different. It takes a while to get used to it. Um, one of the main ministries that we have that I've had for the longest is a prison ministry. And um, so I went up there, and my experience here in Rochester helped me a lot. Also, I was a volunteer in Troy, Ohio, and Dayton, Ohio also. Um, but I went up there, and I went up to the prison, um, and I talked to people. I made phone calls. I said, I'd really like to come in. And some people said, you can't go in unless you're a member of this big uh, ecumenical group of Christians. And I didn't really want to go that way. I said, well, I think God can get me in there. And after about two years, uh, they still hadn't uh, re responded. I had done all the things that I was supposed to do, the paperwork, the phone calls, and I was getting a little bit discouraged. And um, so I said, but you know what? I'm going to try one more time. So I went up to the office, and <laughs> I did something that is not in a missionary handbook on how to you know, enter into ministries. So I, I go up there, and I was, a little, I was a little bit perturbed, to say the least. I was, uh, a holy anger, maybe. <laughs> but I talked to the guy. I said, look, I said, I've been trying for two years to come in here. I've, I've come up here. I've talked to the... the directors, then they say, call this person. So I go home and call this person. And then when you call, they say, no, you got to go back to the prison and talk to this person. I mean, to run you back and forth around. And I said, look, this is, this is ridiculous. I said, uh, you're not supposed to say this. I said, in America, we don't do things like that. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to bring your country into another country. Like we're better than you. But I said, look, I'm from the United States and I was, I got in prison in a month. I mean, Come on, either tell me yes or no, but I've been two years doing this, and I'm a little bit upset about it. Come on. I mean, you know, I was a little bit upset, really. After two years, the next day he called me. The next day they said, sir, we have your pass ready. <laughs> and I've been in there for 11 years, ever since. And with a few exceptions of furlough or come to the States and stuff like that. So I used to go in once a week. Now I go in twice a week, and it's been a, it's been a great ministry. I really love it. There's about 1,000 inmates. And there are all kinds uh, from the misdemeanors on up. And we've seen a number of people get saved, and it's a blessing. And uh, some places are rougher than others. Uh, I found out recently they sell drugs there. <laughs> a guy said, he said, I just quit drugs like three weeks ago. And he called upon the Lord for salvation about a year or two ago in prison. But it's not really grounded. He just knows the Lord. Amen. 
He said, well, I'm gonna, I want to serve the Lord. He said, I quit drugs about two months ago. I said, what? He said, yeah, in the prison. He said, I, I, I spent about $1,000 a month on drugs in the prison, you know. And I had heard that from another inmate as well. And unbelievable that they, they get drugs in, and, and, uh, in ways that, you know, I didn't think were, were possible, but they, they do it. But praise God, we're seeing God working there. We're seeing some fruit uh, that I can tell you about, but I'm not going to take a lot of time. And then, of course, we, we have church. Um, we, right now, we have a small church. We've had three churches that I've worked in. Right now, we're working uh, just about five minutes from our house, and we evangelize the area. Um, so we have church. We're, right now, we're renting a hotel because it's the cheapest. It's really expensive to get a, uh, a storefront or something like that. We don't have enough people to, to do that yet, so pray, pray for our church. Um, the Canary Islands are part of Spain. It's not the most fruitful, uh, um, you know, as far as souls in the world. But you know what? God loves those people, and we've seen some people saved, and God wants to save more people. There's no doubt about that. So we still, we're still plowing the fields, and we're being faithful, love the people, and just try to be a light to them and preach the word, and we trust that more people will get saved. But we're having a great time in church, and uh, we had a Venezuelan uh, young man get saved about three months ago, and we baptized him in the ocean, and that was a blessing. And uh, so I'm discipling him uh, during the middle of the week and so forth. And God's been good. Um, one of the things I like to do, I like to evangelize at the college. There's a university there. It's a great place to evangelize. Um, get a lot of tracks out. I can stand and preach. There's a, like a crossing where a train comes, um, like a subway train, but it's above ground. And then there's a bus station right across the way. And also right there is the entrance um, and the exit for the college people, for the college students. And so I love the college students, and I, I, I love to witness to them. Um, I helped translate a little track. Let's see if I have it in my pocket here. Reach way down. I think Nathan has this in English, but in Spanish, a smiley face. Well, I had it, but I got looking at it, and I really had a desire to kind of redo it because there were some things in the wrong place, I thought, and could be said better. And so Brother Rodriguez Ministry uh, got together with me, and I, I re, kind of reformed it, redid it, and he prints it. And these things are great to pass out. I mean, Almost everybody takes these, and they have the gospel in them, and you can get saved, you know, and uh, it's a blessing. I hand out a lot of those. I also like to go to the high schools, and I'll uh, stand at the corner. Um, when I get out of, out of school, I'll stand out there and just pass them out, hundreds and hundreds, and I try to go to as many high schools as I can every single year. You're not really supposed to do that, but I kind of overlooked that little law. And <laughs> Of course, I've been confronted about it on various times and so forth um, in different ways, but so far, God's kept me, kept me good, right? But, you know, those kids need to hear the gospel. I mean, they're not going to hear it, you know. Um, it's true. Most of their parents are Catholic. They've been brought up Catholic. And here's the sad thing. Most of the people in Spain, including the Canary Islands, they're only Catholic by name, not by practice. Most of them don't. Maybe go to church once a year at Christmas, and they, but they're still going to baptize their child. They're still going to take their child to First Communion and, and have them do all these things. But that other net, they're not Catholic. That's all they do. And it seems to me that the reason a lot of them don't get saved is because of their heritage, their family heritage, and their national heritage has been Catholic. So, you know, if I were to get saved, what's my dad going to think about this? What's my mom going to think? What's my grandmother going to think? And that has a big hold on these people. And it's really a shame because a lot of them are nice people. You know, they're, they're not saved, but they're morally nice people. They're good neighbors and things like that. Uh, so you pray. One, one thing that was really neat, uh, Leanna's friend, who she played with when she was when she lived with us. Now she went to Bible college and is here in the states for the summer. Uh, a little girl named Emma, how old's Emma? 16, 17 years old. But she played with uh, with Leanna sometimes in the street there, and uh, we lived on a cul-de-sac, so there's no danger. But um, so anyway, Emma, well, Leanna was at Fairhaven Baptist College. She wrote her a text and said something like, I, "I'm interested. I'd like to be a Christian. How do I do it? Basically, right? How do we, how do I become a Christian?" And that just came from nowhere. I mean, you don't know how God's affecting your ministry on what you're doing, how you're affecting people. And uh, I would imagine either Leanna or Rebecca, because Rebecca knew her also has been praying for her. But look how God does that. And uh, we still don't know for sure, but hopefully she did get saved. And now she's, she's posting verses on Facebook and things like that from the Bible, you know. And so we're going to try to follow up on that. But God's been good. Many, many people have uh, been, been saved. And I'm thinking of Carlos, who... Uh, lives in Tenerife, but he's an Italian. 
He's an Italian man. He was an atheist, and uh, his family started coming to church. Well, he didn't come to church at the time because he was atheist, but his wife had been fasting, and we were praying for him. And one day, Carlos came into church, and I preached a message on salvation, and I gave the invitation. He raised his hand and said, I want to talk to somebody about being saved. So after the service, I took him down to the first floor. We talked another hour, and he, he got saved. And, uh, you know, God can save anybody. We just have to, we have to be patient, be consistent, and uh, believe in God. Amen. Have we seen Romanian people saved, Spanish people saved? And in the jail, there's German people, English people. Uh, Richard is an English young man. that He got saved about, I'd say, three or four years ago. And he really didn't grow like I wanted him or I thought he should, you know. And I, I started doubting him. I wonder if he really got saved. And I, I really started praying for him there for a while. And then I hadn't seen him for a while, and I went in. And Richard said, man, I'm reading the Bible every single day. He said, I'm reading Psalms. I'm reading the Bible. He said, I'm getting into it. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, when COVID hit, they put me in a solitary confinement. And he said, I just started seeking the Lord like unbelievable, you know. And he said, I'm reading the Bible. And, and uh, so sometimes you see people saved, and then you think, well, they're not really saved. But you know what? A lot of times they just haven't grown. And God has to touch them. And, and so, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing God work, and it's a blessing. That's just a general overview, and uh, I'm sure I could say a lot of other things. Let's go to the Bible uh, tonight and look in Luke chapter 5, if you would. Luke chapter 5. Thank you, uh, Pastor Watson, for the opportunity to come and uh, share our ministry and also preach the Word of God. I appreciate that. We're going to look at Luke chapter 5 here uh, tonight. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for singing that song. I don't know, there's something about that song I just love. <laughs> you probably noticed that <laughs> when I stood up and shouted. I tell you, I don't know. That just that song just gets me. I mean, it's so. Uh, I think it's spiritual. It's talking about. Let me tell you about Jesus, and that's that's what we need to be doing. Amen. And that's what a missionary does. And actually, uh, we're going to cover it tonight. But hopefully, by the end of the message, that's what you should be doing. Amen. If you're saved, that's what that's what you should be doing. Whether you're five years old or 100 years old, we need to be all telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for that he's my Savior. Lord, that I, I know you live in me. I know my name's written in the book of life. I know I'm going to heaven. And uh, Lord, what a blessing that is to have the peace of God, the presence of God, and your power living inside of us. Lord, we have the preserved word of God. And Lord, uh, it's just a blessing to, to know that we have peace with God and that we're going to heaven. And Lord, we have a job to do. You've given us a job to share and preach the gospel to every creature. So Lord, uh, preach through me tonight, teach, and uh, give us a message, Lord, and help us to receive it. And then help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only, lest we deceive ourselves. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gisenerit and saw two ships standing uh, by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Now I've heard some people say draft, so that, that could be right. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, when they had this done, they closed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were on the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Uh, what a blessing that is. And verse 11, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I was reading that passage just the other day, and kind of preparation for this message, and I never realized that they had caught all these fish and they brought them to land. And before they got to land, that's when the conversation took place and, and, and Peter worshiped the Lord and he was astonished at all the fish that they had taken and he fell down 
and he said, depart from me, Lord, from a sinful man. But then they brought their boats to the land. And after that, in verse 11, when they brought their boats to land, when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They left, the, they left all their fish right there, as far as I can tell. They said they brought them and just left the fish there. Amen? You know why? There was something more important. There was something more important that God wanted them to do. He says, I want you to be a fisher of men. Amen? And uh, there's nothing. Uh, our relationship with God is first. Our family. But you know what? After that, we need to be looking to help people come to know God and be brought into the kingdom of God. Uh, tonight, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about being a winner of souls, about being a soul winner. You know, in Proverbs 11.30, the Bible says that the uh, fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The fr fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Amen? He that winneth souls is wise. And the righteous are like a tree. In the Bible, you'll find that a lot of times that people are likened to trees. You know, when the man got... Uh, was blind and, and he got touched by the Lord. He didn't see 100% the first time, but he said, I see people walking like trees. And a lot of times in the Bible, people are likened to trees. And the fruit in that verse is likened to life. See, the Bible says that we are trees of righteousness. Psalms 1-2 says, but, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season and shall not wither, his leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Amen? And the Bible says that if we meditate in God's word day and night, we will be like a tree. And that tree is going to be strong. And that tree is going to bring forth fruit. I remember in, uh, in Mexico eating the pineapples down there. I mean, just as natural as you could be, eating those things and the juice just running down your mouth. You couldn't, you couldn't contain it all over your shirt. And uh, uh, nothing like a fresh piece of fruit. And the Bible says that we are to have the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Uh, this I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're supposed to have love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. Against such there is no law. But there's a little seed in most fruits, amen, like you have an apple. And so people are seeing our life. They're seeing this person, you know, he's a, he's a righteous person. He's not perfect, but he's humble. He loves God. He loves people. He helps people. He's a servant. Uh, he has compassion. He really is a genuine person. They see that fruit. But there's one thing lacking. And I would say, symbolically speaking, that seed, you know, if you eat an apple, most people eat the apple, but they'll spit the seed out. Well, the seed in the Bible is the Word of God. And it's also the Holy Spirit. So they need to see the fruit in your life, but they also need that seed. They need the Word of God to enter in the heart and the Holy Spirit. They need to be saved. Amen? The other day, uh, Nathan, uh, I took Nathan's uh, kids, uh, the boys anyway, we went golfing over in Chai Lai, or in Churchill Road, uh, Churchville. And so I walked, and I, I lost probably nine or ten balls. I, I didn't tell you that, but there's no balls left in the bag. But I, I hit one in the woods, and so I'm in there looking for the ball, you know. And I noticed I love pine trees or evergreens. They're, they're a picture of everlasting life, amen? Beautiful, a beautiful tree that God made. But we know, I look down there at the ground, I see all these little springs sprouts of, of pine trees because that pine tree drops the cones and they form baby baby trees amen and see god wants us to have he wants us to produce fruit and he wants us to produce baby christians amen the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise go to um daniel chapter daniel daniel chapter 12 in one hand Daniel chapter 12, and in the other hand, we're going to go to Luke. We were in Luke, but let's go to Luke chapter, I believe it's chapter 1 that I want. Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. So in one hand, we're going to see Luke chapter 1 verse 15, and the other we're going to see Daniel chapter 12. First of all, let's go to Luke chapter 1. And it's talking about John the Baptist. And in verse 14, the Bible says, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many 
And look at this. And many of the children of Israel shall who? Shall he turn to the Lord their God? It does not say, and many of the children of Israel shall God turn to the Lord their God. It says, and many of the children of Israel shall he, and he refers to John the Baptist, who is a person. Verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And also in verse 17, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. This is talking about a, a person that's turning the hearts. Now, Paul said something similar, and don't look there because we're going to find Daniel chapter 12. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, Neither is Apollos anything, neither am I anything, but we are ministers by whom ye believed. But we are ministers by whom ye believed. In other words, you believed by, uh, through us. By whom means a mediator. It says, you believed because we brought the word. We were ministers. He said, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We know that God gives the increase, but brethren, if you go out and you want to, uh, you want to sow uh, a corn in your field, you just don't go out there and look to heaven and say, God, grow corn in my field. <laughs> Nobody would do that. Well, I don't know, maybe a Calvinist might. Amen? I'm sorry, but I'm not a Calvinist. And if you do, I love you and God loves you. And I know some really good people that are Calvinists, and they're soul winners too. That's the paradoxical thing about it. But God's not a Calvinist. You have to go out there. You have to put the seed in the ground. Amen? You have to put the seed in the ground, and you have to water it. You have to get the rocks out of there. You have to pull the weeds. Amen? And then God will give the increase. Paul said, we are laborers together with God. He said in Corinthians 4.15, in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He did not say that God begot you through the gospel. He said, I I have begotten you through the gospel. That's a hard one for a Calvinist. Their Bible would say, no, God begot you. I understand. God gives the increase. Jesus died on the cross. The Holy Spirit gives conviction. But you are the soul winner. Amen. He said, Apollos planted. Apollos watered. I planted, but God gave the increase. He said, I have begotten you through the gospel. Um, just a moment. Keep in Daniel chapter 12, but look in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, in verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verse 13, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation, that's like a jealousy, them which are my flesh, and might, what? Save some of them. Let's read that again. Verse 14. If by any means I, not God, I, <laughs> Paul, if by any means I, Paul, may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and you can put in parentheses I, because it's talking about I. And I, Paul, might save some of them. He says, that's blasphemy. No, that's what the Bible says, my friend. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. You see, he that went to souls is wise. Amen. Now, who has Daniel chapter 12? You have it, Nathan? Daniel chapter 12, I think it's verse 3. Read that really loud for everybody. And they that be wise in sight as the brightness of the firmament, they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Wow. Do you hear the second part? They, talking about who? Who's they? People. Not talking about God. They, the people that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. Amen? Do you want to shine as a star forever and ever? That's, that promises to you if you're saved. You say, I don't want to be, you know, I'm not serving God for rewards. Well, I'm not really either. But Jesus wants to give rewards because he's loved his children. He says when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when people speak evil about you, and, and, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, jump for joy and rejoice, porque, because in that day your reward is great. God wants to give rewards. He loves us. Do you like to give rewards to your children? When they do right, you say, man, that's good. Amen. God's the same way. He says, look, Nathan, you go out and win some souls. Those are souls that I died for. Those are souls I shed my blood in love, right? And, uh, 
The Bible says the angel of his presence saved him. In love and pity, he hath redeemed him. And he bare them and carried them all the day long. But the Bible says when Jesus died, he died in love and pity. He redeemed us. He says, you go out there looking for those sheep. He says, I'm going to see to it that you get rewarded for that. And it wasn't in my message, but I got thinking about it. And part of the rewards are here. Because in Acts chapter 8, you know the story about uh, Philip. He's out there preaching in the desert in Samaria. And there's a man looking for God. He's an uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And the Bible says that he went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And, but it says he was on his way back down, right? His, he went to Jerusalem, but the Bible doesn't say this, but it looks like to me he, he didn't find the answer. He wanted, he wanted to go worship, but where was the soul winner that took him aside and said, hey, good to meet you. How you doing? Looks like you're from a different country. Would you like to, let's go down and have a Coca-Cola at the corner stand. Well, he probably didn't have it then. But he says, uh, let's have a little coffee. Let me, can I tell you about Jesus? Amen? <laughs> he didn't get his banjo out, man. He, he, he should have got his banjo there. Let me tell you about Jesus. But nobody there told him about Jesus. So he's back down, and God says, Philip, the saints failed me in Jerusalem, but I know you're going to listen to me. I want you to stop. And he was preaching. He was preaching, and people were getting saved. He said, I want you to stop. I got a little job for you. Go out in the desert. And, of course, you know, we have read the Bible, and we know the story. We know why he went to the desert. Philip didn't know why. The Bible doesn't say that God told him why. He said, stop what you're doing and go in the desert. Amen? That's a good Christian soldier, isn't it? If God ever says, hey, stop what you're doing and give that guy a gospel track. But Lord, why? But Lord, I'm talking, hey, I said stop what you're doing and give that guy a gospel track. Amen? Yes, sir. <laughs> Aren't we Christian soldiers? You tell the what to do, but sergeant, why? But sergeant, you stupid knucklehead, right? Go for pile. Just get out there and do what you're told. Amen? <laughs> well, God didn't explain to him what he was Got to use them for. And Philip said, okay. And he went and he found out why he went. He found this guy that was reading the book of Isaiah in a chariot, Isaiah 53. And they had this conversation. And you read the story in Acts chapter 8. And uh, so the Bible, we know the story. He ends up uh, getting saved. And uh, before he gets saved, though, the, the eunuch's a little bit confused about salvation. And so we're talking about being a soul winner. You know, if you're going to be a soul winner, you need to have the doctrine of, of salvation down. It's not a hard thing, but you need to have it. You need to have it, the helmet of salvation. You know, you need to know how to tell somebody how to get saved. And so that eunuch said, well, here's some water. What prohibits me from being baptized? He probably thought being baptized was going to save him. And Philip said, no, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's where he got saved. Of course, may the Bibles take that verse out because the devil doesn't want that verse in there. I wonder why. But he, he got saved and he got baptized. And uh, I know we're here in Daniel. We'll get there in just a minute. And the Bible says that he went on his way rejoicing. Amen? That, that Ethiopian eunuch got saved and he got happy. I don't know about you. I don't know. But when I got saved, something happened. <laughs> the Holy Spirit came in. And I was about as low as a person could get. I was about a half a step from the gates of hell in the spiritual world. And when I got saved, God just lifted me up. And boy, I had a, had a song, had the peace of God, the presence of God, the power of God. I'm seated in heavenly places. I was circumcised with Christ, baptized in him all in the same moment, put in the family of God. And all these promises of a good life, you know, ahead of me, thou prevents him with the blessings of goodness. And now set us a crown, a pure gold upon his head. God already had my blessings prevented from me in my life. So it made him happy. And uh, not only that, the Bible says that Philip was caught away. <laughs> you know, one day we're going to be caught up to heaven. What a day that will be. You know, you talk about having fun on roller coasters, you know, going up and down. Man, we're going up. But the Bible says that Philip was caught away and was found at Azota. And he was preaching. I wonder what kind of high he got, man, when God said, you're, whoo, here we go. <laughs> like time tunnel. And the other day I was, uh, I told this story this morning, but I'm going to repeat it because most of you haven't heard it. But um, so about 10 days ago, we were in Ohio helping one of my, my oldest daughter, Amy, with her four grandchildren, kind of helping her to watch them uh, while she gets custody of them for two or three weeks at a time. But that's another story. But 
Um, so I went. To, I had to go to the Social Security office uh, in order to get a social a Social Security card because I was changing my uh, driver's license from New York to Ohio, and you have to have that card. So on my way down there, I went by through you could you could say more a slummier part of Dayton, uh, a lower class part of Dayton, and I just thought. You know, there's some government housing over there. I mean, like 200 apartments. And I love uh, apartments because they're easy to get. You knock on the door. Like down in Spain, usually, not always, a lot of times uh, you'll have an apartment complex, but they're barred off. And to get inside, you got to push those buttons on the outside. And you might have to go down 10 or 15 or 20 buttons. And most people will not let you in. You know, boop, boop, boop. And you tell them who you are. They say, forget it, you know. But, but if you pray, you got, you'll get in. I, I used to get in. Uh, almost all of them, eventually, but I like to go where, you know, you don't have to go through that. And it just felt in my heart that that was a good place to witness, and on my way home, I, I felt that again. I said, man, this would be a good place. Uh, it wasn't that Sunday, but the next Sunday, after church, it was about 2.30, we got home. It was a beautiful day, and I had nothing to do. I mean, I could do something if I wanted, but it's like the Lord said, Hoover Avenue. Why don't you go to Hoover Avenue? That's where I went by. And so, you know, I prayed. And if you're going to be a soul winner, you need to pray because it's not you that's doing the work. It's God. Amen. Don't misunderstand me. God's the one that does work. But some people get on the extreme and say God does everything and you don't do anything. Well, that, that's wrong. Amen. And it's not that you do everything. God did. No, no. It's right there in the middle. God, you have to have God. But brother, he's going to use you. Because uh, Paul planted the seed, Apollos water, but God gave the increase. And I gave the illustration this morning. Our pastor came, Larry, had surgery, and he just doesn't go to the hospital in surgery and, and lay there in the bed and say, okay, God, do surgery by faith. <laughs> and then a cloud comes down with the surgeon, like a genie comes out of the cloud and the knife and does, no, there's a real man there that studied for surgery, and he's got a real knife, and they do surgery on you. Amen? Hey, God says, preach the gospel to every man. Are you awake? Is Jesus talking to you? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's pretty funny, right? But I just wonder how seriously we take it. We read about it. But you know what? I went down to Hoover Avenue that day. I said, God, just use me. Amen. I knocked on some doors. Had a great time. People were very courteous to me. It was most a black section town. And I love black people. And I don't know where this thing comes about racism and all that. Oh, people are so respectful to me, you know. I, I know there's drug dealers there and stuff like that. So I went to the doors. I ran out of tracks. I had to go back to the car, get some more tracks. I saw these two guys about 15 feet from my car. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, nah, they're probably not going to listen. But I'm going to give them a track anyway. So I got in the car, and I got a whole thing of chick tracks I had. And I went over there and gave them a track. But as soon as I started talking, I realized that they wanted to hear. They were very humble kids, about 1920. But they weren't like, you know, I was thinking they're going to be gangs, they're going to be, you know, I don't know. They're not going to be interested. You know, the devil lies to you. Nobody's going to get saved anymore. <laughs> Nobody's going to get saved anymore. Then. It's all over with. He's a liar, man. God never said to quit being a soul winner. He never said quit going and preaching the gospel to every creature. God never said that. The devil will tell you that. And I went, and I realized pretty soon that those guys wanted to hear the gospel. And so we were there about an hour. I gave my testimony, which is, I, I touched on it uh, this morning, but uh, at the other church. I gave my testimony. I talked about science in the Bible, how the Bible is scientific. And that means the Bible is true. We talked about the tribulation. We talked about the Antichrist. We talked about the mark of the beast. And we talked about a lot of things. And then we talked about the gospel, most of all, about half an hour. We talked about hell. Amen. And after about an hour, I'm serious, about an hour, they're still there. I mean, these guys are serious. <laughs> and after about an hour, I said, well, okay, Lord, what do I do now? I look at them and said, well, what do you think about that? And they just looked at me and said, do you want to repent? Or do you want to keep living in sin and living for the devil? Or do you want God to take sin out of your life? And they said, no, we want to repent. And they meant it. <laughs> and they meant it. So I said, well, uh, you seek the Lord for about two years, and I'll come back and see you. And I left. <laughs> no, I didn't. 
<laughs> Some people would. Just seek the Lord. He's going to come down and just pick you up and shake you and save you. <laughs> Baloney. They want to get saved. Okay, great. See you later. I'm going to go watch the Reds game. Oh, I said, well, since there's two of you, a lot of times I, I haven't prayed by themselves, but if there's two or three, sometimes it's just, I think, good. To, so I'm going to pray with you, and you're going to pray to God. I said, you believe the Lord's going to save you? They said, yeah. Do you understand what we're, yeah, we want to get saved. And they got saved. <laughs> and I, I saw the change. I mean, you know, not a visible, but I saw the countenance change. I said, you get saved? He said, yeah. Two black guys, I just gave him a big hug, man. Welcome to the family of God. Preacher, it can't be that easy. I wouldn't say it's easy, but I wouldn't say it's hard. What did I do? I drove down the street. The Lord said this would be a good place. Philip was preaching, and God said, go to the desert. Not that hard. You just got to obey God, right? I wasn't doing anything else. Now, I could have been doing other things. I could have gone fishing. There was a lake at her. We we're staying at her mom's old mom's, or her mom's house. She passed away. I could have gone fishing. I could have done a lot of things. <laughs> and that's another thing. When Peter and uh, when Peter left those fish in the boat, he forsook all. If you're gonna be a soul winner, you can't be all mess all wound up in this world. Now I'm not saying I like to play tennis. My wife tell I go at least twice a week usually play tennis. And uh, I like to do things like you. I play with my kids and all that. But I tell you what, if you don't put time to try to win some souls for Christ, you'll probably never do it. And it's a priority. God died for souls, and he said, you need to preach the gospel to every creature. And so it, it wasn't that hard to do. I mean, I enjoyed it. I actually enjoyed it. And you know, another thing is, people say, well, I don't feel like it. Welcome to the club. <laughs> To be honest, do you feel like coming to church every single Sunday morning? Every, I mean, if you do, praise God. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's good. I'm not saying you never feel like it. But there's sometimes you just don't feel like it. Do you feel like going to work every, every morning and getting up at 5 or 6 or whatever it is? Brother, you just go do it. It's your duty. The Bible says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon said, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. We don't try to preach and win souls because I feel like it, although it's nice. That day, I kind of did feel like it. Like, Man, this is a perfect day, you know? That's kind of neat. And by the way, it took me back two days later, and three kids got saved. I had a little Sunday school class right there in the parking lot, about another 50 minutes, and they, they wanted to get saved. But um, sometimes you got to sacrifice. you got to put away the things. Peter just brought in two boats full of fish that were probably worth a lot of money. And he left him right there. <laughs> Jesus said, I got bigger fish, right? I got souls of men. And Peter said, I see it. I'm going to leave these, and I'm going to go for that. Amen? But I'm here to tell you, let's uh, read Daniel chapter 12. Not only is winning souls for the pastor and the preacher and the evangelist and the missionary and or whatever other office, deacon, right? But let's look in Daniel chapter 12, and we already read it. Thank you, Nathan. But he says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But this is not talking about just pastors. It's talking about anybody. The context is the great tribulation. Well, we won't be here then. We'll be taken up before that. Thank the Lord. But there's going to be more people than just 144,000, I believe, preaching. There's going to be a lot of people. And you see in Revelation chapter 17, there's a multitude of people that at the end of the tribulation are raptured up to heaven. A multitude from all nations that no man can number. Why is that? Because there's people out there telling other people what they have to do to be saved. Go with me to Jude. Jude, right before uh, the book of Revelation. The book of Jude. First John, Second John, Third John, and then Jude. So Jude says in verse 21, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Before we go on, let's go to verse 1 and find out who this uh, letter is actually talking to. Who is it addressed to? Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father 
and preserved in Christ Jesus and called. He's talking about the Christian, amen, the, the believer, every believer. That's who he's talking to. And so that's the context. He's not talking to a pastor or an evangelist or a priest. He's talking to every single Christian. And in verse 21, every single Christian, keep yourselves in the love of God. Amen. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6.15 that we should be shod with the gospel of peace. Um, I'm thinking of it in Spanish, but hold on right there and I'll, I'll just read it. <clears throat> Stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So that's, that's a verse right there that says every Christian is to take the armor of God, not just the pastor. Every Christian is to take the armor of God. Every Christian is to what? Pray. How often are we supposed to pray? The Bible says always. Oh, come on. That's what it says. Praying always in all application for all saints. I don't do that. I don't know if you do it, but that's a goal we have. Amen. So if we're supposed to pray at least every day, we could agree. We're supposed to pray every day. The Word of God should work in you every day. So the armor of God is not just one time a month or one time every two weeks or one time a week. It's every day. And in that context, he said the Christian is to be prepared with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You say, well, that just means we're supposed to be prepared. You know, 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be prepared if any man ask you reason of the hope that's within you. And you respond in a humble way, you know. Oh, that just means be prepared. No. So you look up the word prepare, and you'll find out that if something in the Bible is prepared, it's because it's going to be used for something. Like Jesus said, I'm preparing a place for you. He's preparing a mansion for you. The reason he's preparing it is because you're going to go there. In Matthew 25, 46, it says that hell is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. God is preparing hell, not for any man, and that shows Calvinism isn't true either because God never intended one man to go to hell. He wants all to be saved. He doesn't want one person to go to hell. What are we doing about it? God hasn't changed his mind. But God prepared hell for the devil's angels. And the Old Testament says God prepared Canaan as the promised land for Israel to enter into it. When God says he prepared something, it means that something's going to happen to that. Like, it's going to be used. So when God says your feet are prepared, he's not just saying in 10 years, maybe somebody will ask you how to be saved. Praise God. <laughs> you're prepared because you're supposed to use it. You're supposed to use the word of God. You're supposed to pray every day. You take the helmet of salvation, and you're prepared because you're going to use it. Amen? My wife prepares food because we're going to eat it, not because we're going to go there and say, oh, how pretty this is. I wish I could eat it. I'm starving to death. No, I'm going to eat it. But how many of us leave the house and say, God, could I witness at somebody today? I know you have to work. Most of you have to work a regular job. I know what that's like. Our, our ministry is also a job, but it's ministry. And so I'm supposed to do that more than you. But if you're supposed to do it too, you can go out every day and say, Lord, help me pass out one gospel track a day. And maybe you could bring a person that might even be uh, open to it already. Or if not, that I can preach to him. Now, the Bible says in Jude that there's two ways that a person can be affected for salvation. <clears throat> Verse uh, 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto what? Eternal life. So eternal life is the context. Verse 22, And some have compassion, making a difference. So it does make a difference to have a, a life of compassion and love. And God is love. Amen? God is love. I meditate on that almost every day. Did you know that the Bible says that God the Father loves us, every believer, as much as he loved who? Jesus Christ. John 17, verse 21. God loves you equal, even as he loved Jesus Christ. Think about that. You ever think about that? How can that be true? God loves me as much as he loved Jesus? Yes. That's a, that's a big love. And Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And one thing to be a soul winner, if we could just realize a little bit that every person you see, God, for example, created that person. He wants that person to be in heaven. 
He doesn't want him to go to hell. He died for that person. Many are called and few are chosen. He calls everybody to fear God and to seek him. If they'll respond, God will save them. God wants that person to heaven, and he might just tell you, would you just go and tell them that I love them and that I died for their sins? Or would you just give them a gospel track? I mean, come on. I, I'm not bragging, but I believe God has given me a gift of evangelism. I believe that's one of my gifts. And so I need to be using it, and I try to use it. So in that sense, you know, I don't want to put my gift on you. But biblically, everybody is supposed to be shod with the preparation of gospel peace. Here it says, and of some have compassion, compassion making a difference. The difference is not have a good day. The difference is not going to hell. Because the next verse he says, and others save with fear, uh, pulling, up, uh, pulling them out of the fire and hating the garment spotted by the flesh. He says, with some use compassion and others take the sword and show them, you're going to die and go to hell. Now you can say it in a nice way. But, you, can, you know, whatever you want to say, I'm not telling you, God, that's the other neat thing about it. Every, every person you talk to is a little bit different, right? And God may say, you tell them this and you tell this guy that. It's pretty exciting, really. It's really the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. It's God that speaks through you. Amen? It's not that hard. You say, Lord Jesus, you speak through me. Lord, you love this person. Lord, you give me the power. It's really not that hard. <laughs> but maybe we're listening to the devil and the flesh. No, man, nobody's going to hear you. Nobody's going to get saved. You're wasting your time. Ah, baloney. I go out there, and I'm doing the most important thing in this universe. Sir, can I give you a little piece of paper? And you know what? God loves you today. Well, thank you very much. You have a good day. And by the way, you, you can go to heaven. It says, and then you start to see the reaction if, he, if he's biting the, the worm. You say, oh, oh, well, let me just tell you one more thing. But if he's still got that hook, he, oh, let me tell you just one more thing. And then you might be there an hour. You know, you go fishing, and uh, if the fish are biting, you say, man, I might catch a fish, you know. And it's good to witness, and we have to sow the seed. I understand that. You know, Paul said, I planted, Paul watered. And that may take a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years. But I think one thing where we make a mistake, we don't believe that somebody can get saved the first time you see them. But they can. <laughs> they can. I've seen them uh, many times say, nah. Well, I say to you, nah. <laughs> but the thief on the cross, right? In the book of Matthew, the thief is, is saying to Jesus, uh, modern vernacular, Jesus, just come from down from the cross, man, we'll believe you. You know, if you do that, we'll believe you. Ha, ha, ha. He's making fun of the Lord with the other one. You come down from the cross, and we'll believe you. They're just making fun of him. But in the book of Luke, it's a different story. He's now reproving the other thief. He says, dost not thou fear God? You know what happened to him? Something happened in him that he's now fearing God. Maybe he had heard John the Baptist preach or one of the disciples, or Jesus Christ, and God brought that word back to him. The word that you sowed, 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 and God brought that word back to him, and he says, I'm going to die and go to hell. I better get saved. And there's only one person, this man right here, is the son of God. <laughs> and he said, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And in Jesus' worst moment, suffering the physical torment and hell itself, with his love, amen, in love and pity he hath redeemed us. He said, Verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. In a short period of time, that guy went from blaspheming God on purpose to having a feared heart and a repentant heart and asked Jesus Christ to save him, and Jesus said, you're saved. The Philippian jailer heard Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail singing praises to God and probably preaching. And if I'm reading it right, he didn't ask the question, what must I do to be saved until God sent the earthquake? I mean, he probably heard sermons. He heard singing. Maybe Paul even witnessed to him. And he didn't say then, how do I get saved? God sent the earthquake. He realized then his life was at stake because if the prisoners escape, they're going to kill him. And so he's thinking, I better kill myself first instead of being tortured and all that. So that's how God put fear in his life. Amen. And God works in different people in different ways. But God put the fear of God in him, and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And they took him to his house, and he, he talked the word of the Lord, and maybe explained it in more detail there. And he got saved, he got baptized. 
But that's another example that the guy got saved. If you read a book of Acts, the whole book of Acts, the first time Paul went to Athens, they're, they're worshiping, that says, the unknown God. He says, you're ignorantly worshiping the unknown God. And uh, he says, you need to seek the Lord and feel after him, if happily you might find him, although he's not far from every one of us. <laughs> you need to seek the Lord, but he's not far from you. He's right there next to you. He wants to come in your heart. If you're not saved, and if you are saved, he wants to help you to win somebody else. But then he goes down, and he said he preached, and then there were three reactions. Some mocked Paul, and that'll happen. Maybe that's why we don't witness and share the gospel. We don't want to be rejected. But that's okay. Jesus was rejected. And that's, that's part of it. But you, you're going to let somebody reject you once or twice, and then I'm not going to witness anybody the rest of my life? Come on. Jesus died on the cross for us. But anyway, so um, I lost my train of thought. The three reactions. One, they mocked Paul. Two, they said, we'll hear thee later of this matter. But three, said some believed Paul and cleaved to him. A man, some men, a woman, and others, maybe teenagers. But that was the first time they ever heard it. When Paul went to Corinthians, they heard the word and they believed. Many. Amen? This thing that, oh, I don't believe that they can hear and get saved. Ah, baloney. Go read your Bible. Amen? If somebody repents of their sin and wants to get saved, they can get saved. Salvation is a free gift. And I'll tell you another thing. <laughs> if you go with the love of God inside of you, and you go with prayer, and you have the power of God. Do you know you have the power of God if you're saved? The Bible says the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him above all heavenly places, far above all personal power. God says, if you ask me, I'm going to give you a portion of that resurrection power so that when you witness, the power of God is being transmitted to them. You have the power of God, but you have to ask for it. You have to believe it. You have the love of God. You have the word of God. You have the fish. <laughs> what are we waiting for? And if you have a little faith, I believe every person in here could win a soul to Christ in, in this year. Or maybe this week. Maybe tomorrow. Amen? It might be up to you. You know what? You say, well, Pastor, I tried for 15 years and nothing. But you sowed up the seed. And how do you know how do you know that none of those people are going to get saved tomorrow? I understand. A lot of it's a sowing. Emma, we didn't know anything. I mean, here, out of the blue, Emma, right here, seen the testimony. Um, her dad helped translate the track for me. I had her mom check it. Maybe she read it. I gave her one one time. I don't know how God did it. She said, I want to become a Christian. That happens too. But I'm telling you, you know, uh, when Peter went out there in a the boat, they caught this big multitude of fish. And there were so many, the nets break, and had to call and help, and had to have the partners help them. Those were fish they caught. And I believe we can do that. I know we can do that. Amen? And uh, I'm going to close right there. And I know there's a lot more things we could say. But I'll close with this. You know, when a soul gets saved, God rejoices in heaven because he died for that soul. And Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You know, when Jesus died, all the pain he took, he said, I'm thinking, and he starts naming all you people that are going to get saved. All the people in the world said, that joy is worth it. Amen? And if you lead somebody to Christ, you know what? It's going to make you happy. When those two guys prayed, I mean, I just felt so happy, you know? I don't know how to explain it, but, man, it's like having a baby. You have a baby. And look at my baby. Look how cute it is. Well, how long were you in, in labor? Oh, it took me uh, seven hours. Well, how much did it weigh? Were its eyes open? What color hair did it have? Uh, who was in there with you? Who was your doctor? You know, a lot of times you tell somebody, got, somebody gets saved, so oh, that's great. Oh, uh, when are we having dinner? <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord, have mercy. I don't know, man. It makes me happy. Hey, it gives me something to live for. And I know when I'm in the Canary Islands or I'm here and I'm witnessing, I'm pleasing the Father. And I'm doing his work. And you know what? You know, we may have a big feeling for all this lost people, but why can't we love them? God loves those people. And he doesn't say witness to them if you feel like it. You don't go to work if you feel like it. He says, just do it. 
And when you do it, you get out there, and after the first track, after the first door, you got the peace of God. Says, yeah, man, you're doing the right thing. Amen? Anybody even start singing a song, just knocking on the doors, you know? Say, Lord, give me somebody that would listen. And what a blessing. Amen? So, Pastor, would you want to come? And I appreciate the opportunity, and may the Lord bless you and your church and your families. Amen. Thank you. Lord, that was wonderful. Thank you very, very much for that message. That was that was perfect. So um, we're going to dismiss here in a second, but uh, hopefully you guys don't have to hustle out. Make sure you get over there and say hello to them and greet them. And like I said, we've been the beneficiary of uh, of their parenting skills uh, in a tremendous way. So so it, thank you very much for being here. It's it's a privilege privilege to have you here. And, and that was a wonderful message. Now, listen, if you're sitting here saying, hey, I don't, I don't know how to tell anybody about Jesus. Well, then come here on Thursday nights and we'll walk side by side down the street together and I will teach you. <laughs> Pastor Schwader will teach you. And uh, that's, that's what we're here for. And, to be, and we go out Thursday nights and do pretty much exactly what he just said. We go there, we knock on some doors and we say, Lord, give us somebody that will listen. And just this past week, when we were up here, just, you know, up here off Culver Road, you know, we had a lot of people that listened. You know, we got to give the gospel to a lot of people. And uh, it was, it's a great experience. If you've never done it, it'll strengthen your faith. It'll really, can you not tell how much it excites him to be able to be a soul winner? It's exciting. You know, when you're struggling and you're in your Christianity and it, and you're just maybe struggling with the flesh or... Um, and you just in a rut and you can't break out of it, then go tell somebody about Jesus. And the Lord will just meet you in that thing and get, get, build up that fruit of joy in your heart and it'll just fire you up. It'll do something for you, let alone what it might do for somebody else. So praise the Lord. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Appreciate everybody being here tonight. Again, thank you for that message. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Judd if you would close us in prayer. And then we got a choir practice afterwards. Okay.